Early in the 1980s, a charismatic leader arose in Miami. Why art thou so far? He drew the weak, the poor, and the powerless to his side. He promised them a better life, but they had to follow his commands to earn it. His temples soon sprouted across the country as thousands were drawn to his gospel. And those who questioned his doctrine started turning up dead. Local police and the FBI had to stop him. In Miami, the discovery of a mutilated body sent investigators on the trail of a deadly cult. But agents found a wall of silence around the cult's members. Potential witnesses, terrified of reprisals, refused to talk. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It would take a massive operation involving 120 agents in seven cities to bring down a deranged fanatic who believed he was God. Friday, November 13th, 1981, Miami, Florida. On the outskirts of the city, a construction foreman was checking his work site. On a dirt road, he came upon something wrapped in blankets. It was a body. He called police. Detectives from Miami-Dade responded. The foreman said he hadn't seen the body when he passed by earlier that morning. What's happening? The body must have been laid there recently. What? No head. Not yet. The detectives inspected the remains. It was an African American male. He had been decapitated. Detectives found only a set of keys on the victim. There was no wallet or identification. Four feet away, detectives found the victim's head wrapped in sheets. His fingerprints were taken in the hopes that they might help identify the man. Decapitations are rare, usually performed to hide a murder victim's identity. According to Detective John King, that wasn't the motive here. There was no attempt to hide or prevent identification because they left the, the head actually on the scene. Usually, if you're going to try to prevent an identification from being made, you would take other body parts, such as the hands or the head also. It seems like it was more ritualistic than anything else, uh, how he was killed. The victim's face was badly damaged. Visual identification would be difficult. And unless the man's fingerprints were on record, investigators would have no way of identifying him from his prints. Perhaps the autopsy could tell them more. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been severely beaten before his decapitation. His nose was bloodied, his teeth were broken, and his eyes were swollen shut. His wrists showed ligature marks, and sneaker tread marks on his body suggested he'd been kicked. 
On the back of his neck, the medical examiner found evidence of repeated blows from a dull blade. It had been a large weapon, perhaps a machete. Comparing the victim's fingerprints wouldn't be easy. In 1981, the database wasn't computerized. Features of the print had to be compared manually against thousands in arrest files. Eventually, one investigator hit the mark. The victim's name was Aston Green, age 25. He had been arrested a month earlier for a misdemeanor driving charge in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, we got a match. They found no history of violent crime. Five, ten. Detectives went to Aston Green's last known address, his mother's house. Uh, my son? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you maybe help us out by telling us... After informing Mrs. Green, Green of her son's death, detectives asked her about Aston. She said her son had recently turned to religion. He seemed very serious about it. She'd last seen him two weeks earlier. She'd prepared a vegetarian meal for him in accordance with his new religious beliefs. So tell me what has been, what's going on with you? What are you doing? They talked about his conversion. He explained he was a Hebrew Israelite, a Yahweh. She told investigators that his son was committed to his Yahweh beliefs. That's when we first heard the word Yahweh. I had no idea what the Yahweh was all about. I never heard the name before. I knew nothing about them. I don't know, but I... Aston Green's mother didn't know his new address, though she did have a phone number. She said he had a housemate, but didn't know his name. From the phone number, detectives determined Green's new address, about 12 miles from downtown Miami. Due to the violent nature of the murder, they called for backup before approaching the house. No one answered. Open up, Dade County Police, open up! Perhaps Green's housemate had been harmed too. Detectives decided to enter the house. The key they found in Green's pocket fit the lock. Dade County Police! We entered the house uh, thinking that hopefully we wouldn't find any other bodies, but we went in to check it out. We found a number of items of a religious nature, uh, textbooks, workbooks, a lot of literature. Uh, it turned out that it was from the Hebrew Israelite religion. There was no sign of the housemate. We also found a, a machete that was tucked to the side of one of the sofas in the residence. Uh, we immediately became interested in the machete because that could be a weapon to decapitate somebody. The machete appeared to be clean. Yeah. Investigators continued their search. Hello. By the door, they found a phone number. They traced it to a house two miles away. Hi, I'm Detective Christopher. This is Detective King. Can we talk to you for a few minutes? At the house, the detectives talked with a group of Hebrew Israelites. I'm sorry I have to inform you, but... Among them was Aston Green's housemate, Carlton Carey. All of them knew Green through the Yahweh Temple. They told investigators that Green, like themselves, had grown disillusioned with the rigid social doctrine of the temple. Can you tell me something about... I've seen him in... Temple, but I don't, I don't to them, know. adherence to the temple's leader was at too high a price. Their colored turbans signified their desire to break away from it. We spoke to them briefly. Uh, we got a little bit of background information on the temple and what it was all about. And we asked them to respond to the homicide office so that we could take 
uh, statements and uh, uh, in-depth interviews with them about what happened and what they knew. Several suggested that the killers were probably zealous members of the Yahweh Temple who wanted to silence those who questioned the doctrine. Most were afraid to say more, especially to police. They were already branded dissenters. They feared any further disobedience could be punished by death. Well, all the people that we spoke to perceived a great deal of danger because of threats that had been made to them, um, both on the phone and by word of mouth from other members that were still in the organization. They were concerned for their safety, and uh, the death of Aston Green certainly confirmed this. The next day, Green's housemates came to the police station to talk. Despite the threat, Carlton Carey and his wife wanted to help. His wife was interviewed in a separate room at the station. Uh, yeah. Carey said that he and Green had embraced the temple until recently when its leader, Hulon Mitchell, started calling himself the true messiah. The charismatic leader of the temple, Hulon Mitchell, believed that blacks were descended from the lost Hebrew tribe of Judah. As followers of Mitchell, members abandoned their given names. They took a biblical first name and adopted the last name of Israel. Mitchell did not allow dissent among his followers. Mitchell eventually changed his name to Yahweh ben Yahweh which means God, son of God. In fact, during the uh, interview we had with him, he referred to Hulin as not the Messiah, but a crook and a swindler, which was his characterization of Hulin Mitchell at that time. Kerry still had reservations about talking to police. Detectives offered to escort him home. All right. He declined, opting to leave with his wife alone. When they left the homicide office that night, they didn't want to be escorted because any police being with them would be further uh, attraction to anybody that saw them, and they were concerned about being seen with anybody. Uh, they didn't want us to escort them home. Carrie and his wife took a winding route home to make sure no one had followed them. They never suspected someone to be waiting inside. As Miami police investigated the beheading of a dissident member of a religious group, two informants were ambushed in their home. Carlton Carey had been shot to death. His wife, Mildred Banks, had also been shot, and her throat was slashed. She barely clung to life. Like the beheading victim, the two were dissident members of the Hebrew Israelites. At the scene, police found a bloodied machete. Detective John King believed a similar weapon had been used in the earlier beheading. The fact that a machete was actually used in an attempt on Mildred's life certainly gave more credence to the belief that uh, the uh, Hebrew Israelites were involved in it. Detectives learned that many members of the Hebrew Israelite movement owned machetes. Police searched the house. Nothing found at the scene indicated who was responsible for the assault. Whoever the killers were, they had cut the phone line and left no physical trace of themselves behind. Detectives' only hope was Mildred Banks. If doctors could save her, perhaps she could name her attackers. Mildred was uh, 
very seriously injured as a result of the attack on her. She was shot in the chest, the bullet was still in her, and she had a deep gash to the left side of her neck. Uh, she was given a very low probability of surviving those injuries. Police waited several days to see if she would survive surgery. Without her description of events, investigators had little hope of solving the case. Mildred Banks pulled through. When she was conscious, investigators visited her in the recovery room. Though critically wounded, she was able to answer questions from the police. She said that she and her husband had driven by their house several times to be sure no one had followed them. They saw no one, so they went inside. She was certain that her attackers were Yahweh's, sent because they had spoken to police that day. She never saw their faces. We were concerned that uh, they may actually make an attempt on her at the hospital, so we posted two police officers at all times with her throughout her stay at the hospital. They were there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for approximately one month. The message of this most recent attack was clear to dissenting members of the Yahweh Temple. Those who spoke out or cooperated with police would suffer reprisals. After the homicide of Carlton Carey, we were not able to locate any of the former members that had split from the temple. They had fled in different directions. They became scared and they just left. Detective King needed to learn more about the Yahweh organization. He and his partner visited its Miami temple. We tried interviewing people, and we really got nowhere. Every time we spoke to somebody, it was praise Yahweh or you know see the uh, public information office at the temple. Through a spokesperson, Hulon Mitchell, the Yahweh leader, claimed to know nothing about the murders and offered no help. Suspecting he knew more, investigators began surveillance on the Yahweh Enterprise. The surveillance was a, sort of a constant rolling type surveillance where you'd drive by, write down some tag numbers. But to actually sit off and watch the place it was impossible because uh, at all times there were guards standing outside the temple watching the front door. Detectives did learn that the Yahweh organization was extensive. In Florida and in 13 other states, the Yahweh's owned real estate, buses, and vehicles that the leader claimed totaled nearly $50 million. Some said membership topped 12,000 in Florida alone. Most of these people are hardworking professionals that really didn't believe in a lot of what Hewlett and Mitchell was teaching. Uh, certainly, they were not racist to the level that he was, and. Uh, they were not believing much of what he was telling them about him being the Messiah. Uh, they did, however, believe much of what the religion itself taught, you know, surrounding Judaism and the, the Muslim religion. Since the Yahweh organization spanned several states, the FBI began investigating. Supervisory Special Agent Herbert Cousins was assigned as case agent. He believed the organization demonstrated elements of domestic terrorism. Domestic terrorism investigations are conducted in a group of individuals who engage in criminal activities to further their social or political goal. Local and federal investigators look deeper into the organization. Why art thou so far from helping me? 
Hulan Mitchell invited the homeless, the destitute, and the ex-con to join his Hebrew Israelites. The Lord shall swallow them up. People with no job or family found a place to belong, receiving food, shelter, and employment. This kindness didn't reflect Mitchell's underlying mission. He taught that blacks, as the true Jewish people, had a crucial role. He told his followers that their duty was to bring about heaven on earth by destroying the white oppressors. To his most avid followers, Yahweh ben Yahweh was the Messiah, and everything they had belonged to him, including their labor. To raise revenue, the Yahwehs manufactured and packaged their own hair care products, tonics, beverages, t-shirts, wine, and more. The merchandise was shipped to his network of temples all over the country. Yahweh required his members to reach certain income goals for their temple by selling these wares. In turn, the temple fed and sheltered them and even educated their children. Despite the allegations of violence and his thinly veiled message of hate, Mitchell's temple continued to prosper and spread. According to Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs, the general public was unclear about Mitchell's true intentions. The Yahweh's in the early 80s had, had been amassing power and property, and they had a, a kind of a dual reputation. People saw them as a, as a somewhat scary group that they knew were preaching hatred and violence. But at the same time, they outwardly appeared to be uh, quiet, uh, well-behaved, mannered, uh, and they would go in and buy these properties in dis distressed neighborhoods and actually clean them up. Not everyone welcomed their presence in the neighborhood. In May 1986, people in Delray, Florida drove them out. At around 2 a.m. the same night, the neighborhood was firebombed. The fire destroyed the entire block and injured one adult and three children, including a nine-month-old infant. Police suspected Yahweh members were responsible. One officer recalled an incident that happened in the area about an hour before the bombing. While cruising the neighborhood, he spotted some men dressed in black standing near a van. The area reeked of gasoline. The men seemed suspicious, but they weren't doing anything illegal. They claimed they were having engine trouble. He took down the license plate number and left. Police determined that the van was registered to an elder at the Yahweh Temple. Hulan Mitchell denied any involvement in the firebombing attack. One of his followers was more cooperative. We were able to develop an informant who actually walked into the FBI, who provided information regarding the group the informant confirmed investigators' suspicions that Mitchell's henchmen were responsible for the firebombing. But he had no direct evidence. He then gave agents information about another crime. He confessed that he had participated in the slaying of Aston Green, the man found beheaded on a dirt road. He said that the dead man had been considered a threat since he openly questioned Hulon Mitchell's authority. Green was abducted from the temple and severely beaten. All right, head back to the van. Head back to the van. The informant drove him there, and another member carried out Mitchell's order to behead him. All right, let's go, let's go! Let's get out of here, let's go! Why should we believe... The information was crucial, but limited. 
Investigators still had no physical evidence tying Hulon Mitchell to Green's murder. Authorities would have to carefully build trust among the ex-members. Detective John King re-interviewed Mildred Banks, the woman who had been ambushed in her home. In following up from the information with Woodside, I made contact with uh, Mildred Banks. And uh, she turned me on to an individual that uh, was a former member of the organization that might be able to assist me. Uh, I subsequently made contact with that person who took me around to a number of locations where former uh, members resided. As investigators continued their search for a witness courageous enough to come forward, Miami police received more disturbing news. A murder victim was found in his car with both ears cut off. Police wondered if this ritualistic killing could be related to the machete attacks. In September of 1986, as FBI and Miami police investigated the leader of the Yahweh's, Hulon Mitchell, police responded to another bizarre murder. 61-year-old Raymond Kelly was found stabbed to death in his vehicle. Both ears had been severed. One was recovered at the scene. Police believed the killer took the other. Metro-Dade Homicide Lieutenant Rex Remley's squad worked the case. In the Dade County area, we had experienced a number of cases in which victims had been murdered and there was an ear missing. In several of those cases, it appeared that it may be the same perpetrator that had committed the crime. To investigators, it looked as if Kelly had been drinking just prior to his death. Detectives collected several sets of prints from the vehicle. But what investigators found missing from the car held greater importance. According to the victim's wife, he always kept a 38 revolver in his glove compartment. Now it was gone. The gun's serial number was entered into the National Crime Information Computer. If the gun turned up anywhere in the country, Miami-Dade police would be notified. Weeks later, police in Opalaca, a suburb of Miami, responded to emergency calls from residents of an apartment complex. It was an apartment complex that had recently been taken under siege, for lack of a better term, by the Yahweh's. Tenants who lived there called it the Dirt Road Apartments. A low-income housing project, some local residents considered it an eyesore. Many were delighted when the Yahweh leader, Hulon Mitchell, bought the property. Dirt Road residents were not. Unfortunately for the residents, their idea of taking the building over was to actually move the residents out and sometimes, according to the residents, that was by force, where the Yahweh's would actually come into their apartments and remove furniture and belongings while the people objected but had no real way to stop these individuals. The Yahweh's strong arm eviction efforts made the TV news. One resident, Anthony Brown, was particularly outspoken. I'm going to stay here until I get eviction notice. I don't care what they say. I do, because they ain't going in. That. He cursed the Yahweh's leader, Hulon Mitchell. Investigators knew that Mitchell didn't tolerate public criticism. Witnesses told police the tensions at the apartments continued after night fell. That evening, violence erupted and two men were killed. Police responded to the double murder.
They chased one of two suspects in the shooting. A canine unit tracked down the man. The suspect carried nothing in his pockets except two bullets. Nearby, police recovered a 38 caliber revolver. It was not the murder weapon. Police cross-checked its serial number in the crime computer, but found no match. The suspect was arrested and taken to the Opalaka police station. Metro Dade Lieutenant Rex Remley interviewed him there. I was just trying to get his basic information, was that he had told me that he was near Raya, Israel, and when I asked him about his age, he told me that he was over 400 years old. So that, that's the type of individual that I was dealing with. The name he gave was a Yahweh name, and police found Yahweh clothing in the car he had used to flee. Police suspected that he had been sent to silence those who had spoken out against the Yahwehs. A fingerprint match revealed that the suspect's real name was Robert Rozier. He had spent time in prison for burglary and car theft. Lieutenant Remley also learned that he was a former football player in the National Football League. He then began to have problems after he had left his football career. He had a history that went from crimes in Maryland to crimes in San Francisco area to crimes in Dade County. So he had an extensive past. Rozier's arrest marked the first time an active member of Hulon Mitchell's group was caught at a crime scene. Though they could only charge Rozier with loitering and prowling, authorities suspected he was guilty of much more. Miami police looked for more information from residents who lived nearby the complex. Most residents were reluctant, but several came forward. We were able to determine that Mr. Rozier had in fact been involved in chasing Mr. Brown across the field. He was present, it was our feeling, when the shots were fired where Mr. Brown was killed and that he had also attempted to flee from the scene. He was charged that morning with the murder of Mr. Brown. Lieutenant Remley still wondered about the handgun found at the time of Rozier's arrest. It was a 38 revolver, the same type missing from the car of murder victim Raymond Kelly. Though a computer check failed to match the guns, Lieutenant Remley pulled Raymond Kelly's file just to be sure. There had to be more of a story to this gun. And I finally found the documents that had been provided by the family that showed the serial number of this gun. When I checked it, I was amazed to see that it was the exact same gun that we had impounded at Opalaka that night. Unfortunately, when the gun had been entered into the computer, the one of the digits had been displaced in some way. And therefore, when we ran the gun found at the scene of the murder in Opalaka, it did not show as being Raymond Kelly's stolen weapon. Robert Rozier was now connected to the murder of Raymond Kelly. Prints lifted from Kelly's vehicle matched Rozier's. His fingerprint was found at another slashed year murder as well. Investigators had enough evidence to charge him with two slashed year murders and the double murder at the Dirt Road Apartments. Rozier found himself facing four first-degree murder charges and very likely the death penalty. As Miami investigators tried to close in on Yahweh leader Hulon Mitchell, they arrested a man suspected of being one of Mitchell's enforcers. Robert Rozier sat behind bars facing four capital murder charges. Investigators hoped Rozier would turn on the leader.
The Yahwehs and their organization became the target of public scrutiny. Hulan Mitchell, their leader, refused to meet the press. He stayed hidden behind his followers, who passed out pamphlets explaining that Rozier had been framed. The bad publicity could destroy all that Mitchell had built. He hired a high-priced attorney and public relations expert. It was Mitchell's first step in creating a new image for his organization. What the hell do you want? I'm here to help you. Mitchell offered the attorney's legal help to Rozier. Rozier quickly realized that the attorney was there to protect the interests of Hulon Mitchell, not Rozier's. But Rozier still refused to turn on the leader of the Yahwehs. Lieutenant Rex Remley recalls that the media attention prompted other insiders to talk. The media brought out different stories about people that had been inside the organization who wanted to speak about what had occurred. And it also brought other people to law enforcement who for maybe the first time realized that there was a significant reason at this point that people were being killed and it was time to come forward and tell what you knew. Investigators got a call from Oklahoma One of Hulon Mitchell's relatives wanted to talk. She told them she'd witnessed a martial arts expert from New Orleans, beaten to death by Yahweh's in 1983. She said Mitchell had ordered the beating. The young man's name was Leonard Dupree. Dupree was killed because Hulon Mitchell believed the man had been disrespectful. Detectives tracked down Dupree's mother in New Orleans. Hello, my name is Rex Rumley. She confirmed that Leonard was a martial arts expert and had left home in 1983 to join the Yahwehs. But without a body or other evidence, investigators couldn't arrest Mitchell. While investigators were learning about Hulon Mitchell's dark secrets, he was opening his temple to the public to improve its image, Mitchell encouraged the most avid followers to take work in the community at large. But one avid member was beginning to change his mind about the leader he had followed so closely. For weeks, Robert Rozier sat behind bars, watching Hulon Mitchell distance himself further and further from the murder suspect. Then, in June of 1987, Mitchell formally excommunicated Robert Rozier on live TV. With the symbolic stroke of a marker, Mitchell had separated himself from Rozier permanently. Rozier had no one left to protect but himself. He decided to begin working with the FBI. It was the break agents were hoping for. Just after his transfer to federal prison, Rozier told investigators that he knew of at least 20 murders across the country that had been ordered by the Yahweh leader, Hulon Mitchell. To agents, it was clear that Mitchell hid behind organized religion as a front for organized crime. Why? Rozier also explained why he and another man killed Anthony Brown and Rudy Broussard at the apartments in Opalaka. For Special Agent Herbert Cousins, it confirmed what he already suspected. Brown and Broussard were, were executed. That's pretty much what happened. Uh, they resisted being evicted from their homes, and they spoke out on TV against the Yahwehs. And uh, we were told that was the reason why they were murdered. Rozier also confessed to the murder of Raymond Kelly and another man whose ears had been cut off. Rozier told agents that the Yahweh leader directed him to kill as many white devils as possible 
and to return with an ear as proof. With Rozier, the FBI had a witness who could connect Hulon Mitchell to deadly violence. But because he was a killer himself, Rozier wasn't an ideal prosecution witness. U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs needed to find others willing to corroborate Rozier's stories. We just started traveling all over the country, uh, tracking down these individuals, trying to convince them to testify and to cooperate. One of the questions that we would get early on uh, from the witnesses or from the prospective witnesses was, will I be at risk uh, if I testify? Will something happen to me? Am I likely to get killed? It's the only time in my 22 years of experience that I have told people, because I felt like I had to tell them, is that yes, there is a chance uh, that you will suffer retribution. Hulon Mitchell fought the investigation by continuing to polish his public image. I'd like everybody to give a nice warm welcome. He continued to turn distressed buildings into gleaming properties. In the opening of the store. As Yahweh Ben Yahweh, he toned down his anti-white message and made large contributions to popular causes. I think it'll make the area a better place. Watching Yahweh become stronger and stronger and watching him become more and more accepted by the community, I, as well as all of the investigators, felt he had to be stopped. Hulon Mitchell area became a bigger-than-life public figure, enjoying all the legitimacy money could buy. He seemed unstoppable. After almost a decade of investigation, the FBI still lacked enough evidence to arrest self-proclaimed messiah, Hulon Mitchell. Intimidation and murder had silenced most who dared to speak out against him. Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Scruggs had a difficult time persuading members to overcome their fear. I prayed with people, uh, I begged people, I cajoled people, uh, I urged them to do the moral thing, I urged them to, to do the ethical thing, uh, I urged them to fight a false religion, and basically used every means I had available to me uh, to convince people to cooperate those bold enough to stand up against Hulon Mitchell, the man who called himself the okay. Son of God, okay. were placed under question? witness protection. Do hereby proclaim Sunday, October 2nd, 1990, as Yahweh Ben Yahweh did. As Mitchell continued to thwart the investigation privately, publicly, his legitimacy grew as Yahweh Ben Yahweh. He's having photo op sessions with the mayor. Uh, the mayor proclaims Yahweh Ben Yahweh Day, and there are banners on the streets saying, you know, proclaiming Yahweh Ben Yahweh Day. In October 1990, despite his public successes, the FBI filed sealed arrest warrants for him and a dozen of his followers. They were kept secret to allow the FBI a month to plan the arrest. Agents dubbed the plan Operation Jericho. Special Agent Herbert Cousins knew it would be dangerous to take Yahweh Ben Yahweh in Miami since he was at the height of his popularity there. The main issue for law enforcement was safety. The safety of the individuals, the law enforcement members involved in the arrest, and also the safety of innocent uh, individuals and the safety of Yahweh members, including Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Fortunately, Mitchell and others named in the indictment were scheduled to embark on a multi city tour. Yahweh Ben Yahweh's first stop would be in New Orleans. The main arrest team would seize him at his hotel. Once he was in custody, teams in six other cities would capture his henchmen across the South. There were a number of arrest teams in different cities, several cities, Atlanta, North Carolina, 
New Orleans, Miami. I was sent to New Orleans to assist the New Orleans division with the arrest of uh, Yahweh Ben Yahweh. On November 6th, 1990, Hulon Mitchell arrived at the Monteleone Hotel in New Orleans. The FBI was already there. To track Mitchell's movements, undercover agents were posted on every floor. They're coming up now. They're coming up. Throughout the South, teams Perfect. took their positions outside Yahweh temples and waited for orders from Miami. Success depended on an unbroken flow of communication. The agents in Miami coordinated the entire operation. Everybody's ready to go. At 3 a.m., everyone was in place. They gave New Orleans the go-ahead. Agents in the hotel called Mitchell's room. The first instruction was that he instruct his bodyguard to turn himself into the agents who were waiting down the hall. Here comes the bodyguard. The second instruction was that he come out with his hands up and that he walk slowly down the hall. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Agents didn't know if Mitchell or his bodyguards were carrying weapons. You see your hand. Finally, their main you. suspect emerged. Hands on your head. Not on your knees. They sent word to Miami. You're under arrest. Mitchell was captured. Murder. Go. Gotta go. The other teams swarmed in, arresting the criminal members of Mitchell's temple. Go. Get down! Get down! Get down! Get down! In a matter of minutes, scores of agents mobilized to capture a dozen suspects across hundreds of miles. No one was hurt. We accomplished our goal. We arrested as many individuals as we could identify during the operation. And that's why I believe it, it was very successful. Yulon Mitchell was charged with extortion, conspiracy, and murder in aid of racketeering. Prosecutor Scruggs believed he was still dangerous. We found out that there was actually a hit team of five individuals uh, who were stalking us, trying to find out where we were so that they could kill us upon the orders of Yahweh ben Yahweh. At trial, his intimidation even penetrated the jury. We knew there were serious problems. We knew people were scared. Several jurors actually got dismissed prior to deliberations because they were scared to go back and deliberate. Perhaps it was fear that caused what prosecutors considered only a partial victory. In May 1992, Hulon Mitchell and six of his more violent followers were found guilty of conspiracy. But Mitchell himself received only 18 years in a maximum security federal prison. It had been a difficult case for investigators. He found a successful uh, philosophy that people would flock to and actually start joining and pledge their allegiance to him. And I think the more power he obtained, the more influence he, he obtained over his followers, that he ultimately lost control of himself. And he believed in his own mind he could do anything, even order life and death. Hulon Mitchell is locked away, his murderous actions halted by those who saw through his false gospel.
In Arizona, a shipment of money vanished into the high desert along with the two men hired to guard it. The FBI didn't know if the guards were participants or victims of an ambush. Answers lay somewhere in Arizona's vast Northwest Territory. FBI agents struggled to piece together scattered clues to reveal the truth. In Arizona, an armored van loaded with cash failed to reach its destination. Authorities suspected an inside job. When the vehicle was recovered, with the drivers and the cash missing, those suspicions grew even more. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. This well-planned crime required extraordinary efforts to solve. The FBI knew that the smallest detail could make or break the case. May 24, 1977, Phoenix, Arizona. A security company transferred $333,000 in cash and coins from their vault to an armored van. Two courier guards prepared for another day distributing cash to Arizona banks. Y'all about ready to go? We've got a problem with this door. I think you want to take a look at it. Let me see. One guard discovered a problem with the van's side door latch. They would report to the company maintenance garage before they set out. This delay put Cecil Newkirk and Russell Dempsey an hour behind schedule. The day's route included stops from Phoenix, 150 miles north to Flagstaff. Uh, With the delay, it would be difficult to make all the stops. Banks waited on the deliveries to provide cash to their customers. By 10.30 a.m., the security company received a call from a bank complaining well, we the, they had not received yeah, their had delivery. The problems with the van, so got a little late start. Eh, well, they should be there shortly. You know, At first, the dispatchers okay. thought the late start explained right. the problem. Right, we'll keep us informed. All right. But throughout the afternoon, the dispatcher couldn't reach the guards. Base courier one. Dempsey, you out there? This is base. Come on in. By 4.30, the company contacted the FBI. The Phoenix field office broadcast an APB for the armored van to all area police. State and local authorities used the remaining light of the evening to search for the missing van. They found no sign of it or the courier guards. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth, now retired from the FBI's Phoenix field office, wondered if the guards had driven off with the money. One of the first things that you do is certainly look at the drivers to see whether or not that might be a possibility as to what had happened, whether there's a driver involvement. Both of the missing guards were married. That evening, an FBI agent interviewed each of their wives separately. They confirmed that neither of their husbands had financial problems that would provoke them to steal the money. Company officials agreed. Both guards had given 20 years of faithful service. The missing van's route covered a vast area of the state. Authorities had nearly a thousand square miles to search, and most of that terrain was remote desert. What are the chances that either of these guys 
The next day, Arizona Department of Public Safety helicopters retraced the guard's scheduled route. They flew up Interstate 17, north toward Flagstaff, checking all exits. Pilots spotted the van 50 miles north of Phoenix. It had been abandoned a quarter mile off the interstate in a remote area near the town of Bumblebee. Arizona public safety officers and local deputies cordoned off the area before the FBI arrived. Agents approached the van cautiously. They did not want to disturb the footprints tracked around the vehicle. The armored van's doors were locked. From the outside, there was little to indicate what had occurred. There didn't appear to be a struggle on the inside, but we had to actually get inside the vehicle before we could really conduct a thorough investigation or examination of the van. And it wasn't until later on that morning that they had brought a spare set of keys out and we effected entry into the van. The radio was still on. Yet the base had not received any calls for help. The van's siren had not been tripped. A shotgun kept in the van for defense had not been fired, and its safety was still engaged. The guards had not used any of their resources to signal that there had been a robbery. In the back, agents found bags containing several thousand dollars in coins, but $293,000 in paper currency was missing. Blood spatter on the carpet and money bags indicated someone had been injured, but agents didn't know who. Your biggest fear at the time, of course, is, uh, is for the safety of the guards. Uh, money can always, always be replaced, your life cannot. And so we were uh, certainly concerned about the guards' fate. Amongst the footprints in the dust, investigators noted a separate set of tire tracks behind the van. Evidence technicians captured the tire prints with photos and plaster casts. Agents concluded that it was unlikely the guards had been overpowered by a single perpetrator. The location of the van, uh, the condition of the van, and everything that we found at the scene uh, just told us that uh, this was a crime that had been well planned and probably had been committed by more than one person. There. Deputy Dale Lent from nearby Mojave County was brought in to assist the investigation. A narcotics officer trained in ground print identification, Lent could reconstruct crimes from foot and vehicle prints. He was one of only two trackers qualified to testify in Arizona court. The first concern was to check the area to see if the guards had been taken somewhere away from the van and, and something had happened to them. So, uh, the first thing I did was do a 360 around the scene, uh, which included checking uh, the road further up. The guards were nowhere to be found. But on a hill near where the van was abandoned, Lent discovered more tire tracks and footprints. From this position, there was an unobstructed view of the interstate that the guards traveled. Back near the van itself, the deputy found two separate sets of large footprints. Based on his observations, Lent concluded that at least one other vehicle and two perpetrators had been involved. The vehicle had come down, backed up near the van, picked up something up, whether it be the two guards or whether it be uh, the money, hard to tell. But I, I'd say it was the money because it was a trail. It wasn't just one. It was a well beat out path. Examining the strata of tread prints, Lent deduced that one vehicle had followed the van from the interstate to where it was abandoned. Deeper tracks leading back into the interstate showed that the vehicle had left much heavier than when it came. Investigators believed that dead or alive, the guards had been taken by the assailants. 
the FBI turned to the media for help. We did what we could to keep this on the front page of the news, and we did what we could to make sure that people were aware that we were looking for uh, these guards. The media reports generated calls from witnesses. Several motorists claimed to have seen the van stopped on the northbound side of Interstate 17 on the morning of May 24th. One saw an Arizona Department of Public Safety officer walking towards the van. Other witnesses had similar stories, but details differed. The make and color of the officer's car varied. In some accounts, he was parked in front of the van. Other times, he was stopped behind. Agents contacted the Arizona Department of Public Safety. No officers had reported stopping an armored van on I-17 that morning. Well, at that point, um, I was fairly convinced that uh, something uh, amiss had probably happened to the guards, that uh, somehow, someplace, they had been stopped and um, they had let their guard down and uh, that they'd been taken captive. And um, being that we didn't find uh, the guards uh, in the immediate vicinity, it uh, soon became evident that the guards probably were taken uh, against their will. The FBI and Deputy Lent searched Interstate 17 for the spot witnesses had described. The tracker found the place where he believed the van had been stopped. The marks were fresh within the time frame, 24 to 48 hours. You could see where the door was, where somebody got out, where there were scuff marks there on the ground. It looked like, you know, where there'd been movement. Digs and gouges in the dirt indicated that there had been a struggle near the rear of the van. A second vehicle's tire tracks at the interstate matched those in the remote area where the van had been abandoned. Curiously, the same tracks were found further up the road, just in front of where the van had been pulled over. Several motorists even underwent hypnosis to provide details to a sketch artist of what they remembered. Some recalled that the officer at the scene wore a hat. Others claimed the officer had no hat. But none of the sketches produced any leads. The FBI had reached a dead end. Then, on the morning of June 16, 1977, 300 miles northwest of where the van had been abandoned, two men made a gruesome discovery while fishing at Lake Mead. The men discovered a body floating in Debbie's Cove. They contacted the National Park Service. Investigators sped to the cove where the body had been spotted. Local law enforcement joined the National Park Service divers. They pulled close to the corpse. The body was fully clothed. Its head and torso were covered with a canvas bag. An officer retrieved a wallet from the back pocket. The victim was Russell Dempsey, one of the missing armored car guards. The divers searched the area, but couldn't find the second guard's body. Not far below the surface, they discovered two sticks of wood connected by a rope. Hey guys. What do you got? Okay, bring it on over to the boat here. To investigators, it appeared to be a garage used to strangle someone. The robbery was now a murder investigation. Investigators still had nothing that could lead them to any suspects. They only knew 
that an Arizona public safety officer, or someone masquerading as one, might be involved. On the morning of June 16, 1977, National Park Service divers in Arizona retrieved a dead body from Lake Mead. It was one of two armored car guards that had disappeared on May 24th, along with $293,000. The whereabouts of the second guard and the money remained unknown. The county medical examiner determined that the guard found in the lake had suffered a heart attack. He had also been strangled. Investigators believed that a garrote recovered near the body had been used to choke him. A strand of the victim's hair found tangled in the device supported their suspicions. FBI agents traveled to Lake Mead to question people who were familiar with the resort area. Whoever had dumped the body had likely used a boat to get to the deeper water. More than 20 agents canvassed rental shops around the 247 square mile lake. No one reported any suspicious activity, but agents collected rental receipts in the hopes they'd eventually have a suspect's name to reference. Special Agent Laird Heastand, now retired from the FBI's Kingman Resident Agency, joined the case. He would search for names on receipts any place a traveler might have visited in the area. We didn't have any good leads on who had committed this crime. And our assistant uh, agent in charge in the Phoenix office decided to have FBI agents check every service station from the area where the armored car was located all the way up to Lake Mead where the body had been transported. That was a distance of more than 300 miles. Considering all the different routes to the lake, the agents had hundreds of service stations to check. The agent started his inquiries at the station owned by an acquaintance named Stan. I asked Stan if he had heard anything about the robbery, and he said to me, I'd been waiting for somebody to come to talk to me. And then he related to me that the day after the robbery that he had to take his tow truck up to uh, Lake Mead and uh, pull a truck out of the lake that had backed out into the lake. On May 25th, Stan had received a call from two men whose truck was stuck at Benelli Landing on the lake. The men explained they had gotten drunk while fishing and backed their truck too close to the water. The owner didn't see any fishing equipment in the pickup, but he did notice drag marks in the dust of the flatbed. It appeared that something heavy had been hauled out of the back. All right. Stan brought the two men to his service station. He wrote a receipt and asked for a signature. The customers hesitated before one agreed to sign. The name he used was Mike Poland. The station owner believed he'd be able to identify the men if he saw them again. It was the break investigators had been hoping for. The ease by which he found it surprised Special Agent Heastand. The first place I walk into, I develop this information. It, it totally caught me off guard and, and shocked me. And I said, oh, boy, this is it. We, we finally we have something that uh, we can start from. Agents searched for the name Michael Poland amongst the thousands of boat rental receipts collected from Lake Mead. After several hours, they found it. Michael Poland had rented a boat the day after the robbery, 
naming Benelli Landing as his destination. It was the same spot from where his truck had been towed. Agents returned to Lake Mead, searching for additional evidence between Benelli Landing and the boat rental shop on the opposite shore. Within the breadth of that four and a half mile span, officers spotted another bag covered corpse floating on the surface. It was the second missing courier guard. He had been severely beaten before he was drowned. The medical examiner found two welts on his chest, consistent with wounds inflicted by a high voltage taser gun. The guard's personal effects were removed, including a self-winding watch that had stopped at 10.37 p.m. on May 26th. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth's team redoubled their search for clues at Lake Mead. Based upon where their bodies were found and the currents and the length of time that we felt that they had been in the water itself, we were able to track back where we thought they may have been put in um, at Lake Mead. That area was just 100 yards from Debbie's Cove, where the body of the first guard had surfaced. Divers focused on a ledge 12 feet down that bordered an 800-foot trench. A sweep of the ledge yielded a third canvas bag, similar to the ones that covered the bodies. The bag was sent to the FBI lab for processing. Inside the bag, agents recovered an Arizona license plate that resembled those used on Arizona public safety cruisers. Two revolvers were also found, but no prints could be lifted from the corroded weapons. Rocks that matched those from the Nelly Landing had held the bag at the bottom. Examiners also found concrete dust caked in the weave of the canvas bag. Agents called on Stan, hoping the service station owner could identify a driver's license photo of Michael Poland, one of the two men that had hired him to tow their pickup from Benelli Landing. Among six photos, Stan recognized the face of Michael Poland. The FBI had finally confirmed a primary suspect. They hoped Michael Poland would lead them to another. In June of 1977, the FBI pursued whoever killed two armored car guards and made off with $293,000. Tire tracks and footprints at the crime scene suggested that at least two perpetrators were involved. Agents believed one of them was Michael Poland, they hoped surveillance of Poland would lead to another. Though he did not appear to have a job, Poland was spending a lot of money. Agents saw a new motorcycle on the property. The FBI identified a man who visited frequently as Michael's younger brother, Patrick. Patrick Poland had just bought a new car. When the brothers were inside, an agent approached Michael's teenage son and complimented the new motorcycle. The boy responded that his father had recently bought two of them and a lot more. Agents expanded their investigation to include Patrick Poland and subpoenaed the financial records of both brothers. Prior to the armored van robbery, each had severe money problems. Shortly after, their debts had been paid and both had purchased new vehicles. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth compared their income to their recent spending habits. We tried to document as much as we could as to how much money they were spending and to uh, what kind of means of support that they had. And the two just didn't seem to mesh very well. 
And uh, when that happens, and then you know that folks have got uh, access to uh, a fairly large amount of money with no real means of support, uh, that's a pretty good clue to us. Agents interviewed the brother's father and photographed his pickup truck. Mr. Poland admitted that his sons had borrowed the truck on the day of the robbery. The father had mixed concrete in the flatbed several weeks before the robbery. Agents took a sample of the dust for processing. FBI examiners analyzed the concrete sample. They compared it to the cement dust on the canvas bags recovered from Lake Mead. Examiners concluded that the dust on the bag had come from the same batch of concrete taken from the truck. Once again, the FBI asked Stan to look at a photo lineup. The station owner could not identify Patrick Poland as the man with Michael. He looks exactly like him. But he did recognize their father's truck as the one he towed from the lake. That's it. That's it. In the early morning of July 27, 1977, agents arrived at Michael Poland's house with a search warrant. Poland claimed to be a self-employed jewelry salesman. He said that on the day of the heist, he was in Las Vegas buying gems. Three days. What you do on the way back? Investigators found twelve thousand dollars in cash. He claimed it was used for their jewelry business. The agents confiscated numerous receipts. One of them was for a pair of high-voltage taser guns sold to a man named Mark Harris a month before the robbery. A short distance away, agents searched the house of Michael's brother, Patrick Poland. FBI Special Agent Frank Mallory, now retired, asked if he and his brother Michael had been at Lake Mead. Patrick gave a different story than his brother had. He initially said that he and his brother were there fishing. He was very nervous. He was extremely nervous. He had difficulty in explaining a lot of um, about his whereabouts, particularly on the day of the crime and the day after the crime. While Patrick was being interviewed, he received a call. It was his brother, Michael. Yeah, they're over here too. He urged Patrick not to talk to investigators. The search at Patrick's house yielded a stash of weapons and $16,000 in cash. The FBI tracked down and processed the cars the brothers owned before the robbery. Different. The tire treads did not match the tracks found at the crime scene. Examiners found no physical evidence that tied the cars to the crime. Agents visited the gun store where the tasers had been sold to Mark Harris prior to the robbery. The clerk who had made the sale could only remember that Harris was a white male in his 20s. Since the receipt was found in Michael Poland's home, they theorized it was probably his alias. One of the things the FBI does is try to eliminate all other good logical suspects, and we did this in that case. The name Mark Harris, a rather common name, we had to eliminate that name as being uh, anybody other than the alias of Mike Poland. Special Agent Mowry searched public records for a Mark Harris between the ages of 25 and 40. We actually identified literally hundreds of Mark Harris's from uh, vehicle records, uh, motor vehicle records, uh, phone books, and every way we could, and went out to their houses physically, tracked them down and interviewed them, and uh, found that they did not have anything to do with this crime. With no proof that Mark Harris was an alias for Michael Poland, and no physical evidence tying the brothers to the crimes, agents couldn't arrest the brothers. 
For the next 10 months, all agents could do was keep careful track of their movements. Special Agent Chenoweth flew helicopter surveillance. We wanted to know everything that Michael and Patrick Poland did, uh, what they had done in the past, what they were going to do in the future. Investigators continued to document the brothers' spending habits. They watched as the Polans closed a deal on a gaming arcade. Despite the circumstantial evidence, agents were unable to make an arrest. The FBI had to find stronger physical evidence to prevent the Poland brothers from getting away with murder. In April of 1978, the FBI suspected Michael and Patrick Poland of killing two courier guards and stealing nearly $300,000. After 11 months of investigation, agents did not have enough to convince a grand jury to indict. FBI Special Agent Frank Mowry desperately searched for evidence that would strengthen the case. What we badly needed was physical evidence. We didn't have fingerprints. We didn't have any real good eyewitnesses. We didn't have any physical bits of um, evidence that could leak Mike and Pat Poland to the crime. The agent focused on the three canvas bags retrieved from Lake Mead with the guards' bodies. He checked with over 20 sources in the Phoenix area where the bags might have been manufactured. None recognized the work. Nobody could even give me a hint of who in town would make such a bag. Uh, some even said, well, they probably came from out of town. So I became very discouraged. The agent visited the last store on his list and showed the bag. The owner recognized it as coming from his company. It was a custom size with a unique stitch sewn only by their seamstresses. He also identified the specially ordered cord purchased from a Georgia company. As far as the owner knew, his was the only shop in the area that made anything like it. He said, I will have in my record somewhere a receipt, because somebody would have walked in that door there and they would have said, uh, I need to order so many bags, a certain length, a certain width, certain specifications. At the Phoenix FBI office, agents poured over hundreds of receipts covering years of business from the bag manufacturer. After almost a week, they found one receipt for three custom canvas bags dated one month before the robbery. They were sold to a man named Mark Harris. Agents had seen the name before on a receipt for a pair of tasers. They had found the voucher months earlier during a search of Michael Poland's house. The FBI was further convinced that Mark Harris was an alias from Michael Poland. The canvas bag receipt connected the alias to the murdered guards, and cement dust in the pickup the brothers drove matched dust found in the bags. On May 17, 1978, after nearly a year of investigation, a federal grand jury returned an indictment for murder, kidnapping, and robbery against Michael and Patrick Poland. Gentlemen, these men should both the FBI suspected that the Polans would not surrender quietly. They've both already killed two men that we know of. You got your route planned. You're going to be picking up Patrick. Got it. We're going to be picking up Mike. Check your weapons. Check your vests. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth believed an armed confrontation was possible. It had to be very well and meticulously planned. Uh, the Polans were very violent. They had shown their violence. They had a strong propensity to uh, you know, commit violence as evidenced by uh, the guards' fate. And one of the things that we absolutely knew we could not do was to arrest them while they were in the, in the house. And um, we absolutely had to take them away from the homes. Agents feared the suspects would barricade themselves in their houses and shoot it out if they discovered they were going to be arrested. This guy. Agents waited for Patrick Poland to emerge. When he finally did, they noticed he was carrying a case for a handgun.
They tailed him for a safe place to make the arrest. The second arrest team waited for Michael Poland to come out of a real estate office. Once outside, there would be less risk to bystanders if shooting erupted. The first arrest team caught up with Patrick outside the game arcade. The agents intercepted him before he entered the building. We identified ourselves. Of course, he knew me already from previous contacts, and I told him the time had come, and uh, we had warrants for their arrest, and he gave up without um, any, um, any problem. Uh, he was armed. He had a 44 Magnum weapon on him and another couple of weapons in his car, but he made no effort to use them. Agents radioed the other team that Patrick had been picked up. Michael Poland had been in the real estate office for almost 45 minutes. Agents feared that he had somehow gotten word of Patrick's arrest and was preparing for an armed confrontation. They decided to risk entering the building. Federal agents, please step back. Mike Poland, you're under arrest. The suspected murderer surrendered without incident. Michael Poland refused to answer questions. He insisted his brother do the same. No fingerprints tied either brother to the murdered guards or the abducted van. Michael remained confident that the FBI case was weak. When a case like this, you've got uh, a joint venue. Uh, venue certainly lies with uh, the federal government with respect to the actual robbery of the van. And, um, but we also have a homicide case that rests with the state authorities. Authorities considered their best strategy for a successful prosecution. State and federal prosecutors decided to split the charges. The Polands went on trial for robbery and kidnapping in federal court. Based on the circumstantial evidence gathered, a federal jury found the brothers guilty of the charges on February 15, 1979. They were sentenced to 100 years. These were two guards that were very hardworking, very loyal to their company. Both of them had worked for about 20 years for the company. They were actually within weeks of retiring. They were family men. They were good men, uh, religious men, men that um, had uh, devoted a lot of time and effort and loyalty to this company. And on the eve of their retirement, uh, they were killed. In November of 1979, an Arizona state jury returned a guilty verdict for murder. The judge gave the brothers the death penalty. The Polands appealed their conviction. The Arizona Supreme Court found that the testimony of a hypnotized witness and the taser gun evidence should not have been used. They also found that the jury had inappropriately discussed the federal trial. The Poland brothers' state murder convictions were overturned. Though agents were certain that the brothers had brutally murdered two men, state prosecutors would not seek a new trial. Because of parole laws at the time, Michael and Patrick Poland would be eligible for parole in less than seven years. In 1982, an Arizona prosecutor declined to retry Michael and Patrick Poland for murder. He cited the cost, as well as the difficulty of proving the case with the evidence that had been excluded by the Arizona Supreme Court. 
United States attorney Melvin McDonald was outraged that the Poland brothers might get away with murder. I had followed it uh, by way of the media and had never dreamed that I would play any role in the case until 1982 when it became clear that the ball was going to get dropped unless somebody stopped in. I called the county attorney and volunteered to take the case. For the first time in history, a U.S. attorney was deputized as an Arizona state prosecutor. McDonald had to resurrect a case that many considered impossible to retry. There had been uh, five years transpired between the time of the crime and the time of the trial. Witnesses travel and move all over the country. Memories start to fade. And so you've got to recreate and present the crime as if it happened a month ago when you're facing the problem that it's really five years old. The prosecutor wanted to lock down the exact time that the victims had been deposited into Lake Mead and prove it was the same time the Polans were at the lake, so there would be no question the Polans were responsible. One of the problems with the finding of the guards was that their bodies were not and recovered for six weeks. Uh, the defense, we knew, would argue uh, that they could have been dumped there by the real killers at any time. Working with the FBI, the prosecutor found a piece of evidence that had been overlooked in the earlier trials. The second guard's self-winding watch. Examiners noted that the watch stopped at 10.37 p.m. on May 26th. That particular self-winding watch would stop working if it weren't moved for 12 hours. That meant that the guard's watch stopped 12 hours after his arm came to rest at the bottom of Lake Mead. We actually had watch experts take the watch apart to prove that the watch had not stopped because of water damage. There was no water that had gotten into the uh, in, uh, portions of the watch that controlled its operation. We literally went all the way to Switzerland to get experts there to talk about how much time it would take for a watch that hadn't, be cleared and hadn't been cleaned in five years to finally unwind. Watch to the jury, please. Forensics experts used this information to Ladies determine exactly when the bodies had been dumped into the water. When the deceased, Their estimation exactly matched the time the FBI had established that the Polans were at the lake getting their pickup towed from Benelli Landing. The prosecutor explained that the brothers had been there to dump the bodies. For the drama point, I told the jury that while Mr. Newkirk is dead, he is speaking to you from the grave. He's asking you, look at my watch. I'm sending you a message through my watch. After three hours of deliberation, the jury was convinced. Will the defendants rise? On November 18th, 1982, they found Michael and Patrick Poland guilty of murder. The judge reinstated Order the sentence of death. All rise. Once again, the defendants appealed the conviction. It was one of the rare instances where their case went to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States, in a published opinion, a very closely divided court, again affirmed their conviction and sentences. How the situation... With nothing left to lose, Patrick Poland agreed to tell investigators and the families of the victims exactly what happened. In 1987, he gave his confession to FBI Special Agent Frank Mowry. They had actually spent almost a year tailing the van. They knew its route on those mornings that it went up to Prescott and delivered its money to the banks in Prescott. They knew the exact route. They knew the stops that it made. They knew the times that it did it. They knew everything about it. The Polans used neither of their own cars in the robbery. They had rented one with cash that the FBI was unable to trace. We never found it. It was a rental car. And by the time the rental car was taken back, it was, by the time they figured out what was going on, it had been rented out probably 200 times since then. And we were never able to actually pin down for certainty the car that may have been used in the case. The brothers affixed a light bar 
and a license plate that resembled those used by the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Batteries for you for that CB? I believe so. They readied their tools needed for the heist. The Polans waited more than an hour. The van was unexpectedly delayed. Finally, they saw their quarry. Patrick drove the disguised car while Michael hid under the dash. They stopped the van on the pretext of speeding. Company policy insisted that the guards never open the van doors to anyone, even if stopped by the police. Patrick ordered the driver to step out. When he failed to follow procedure, the driver and his partner were defenseless. The Polans put the guards in the rear of the van. Michael was to drive the van while Patrick drove the car. But when Patrick took off, the van didn't follow. This explained the tracks found in front of where the van was stopped. By the time Patrick reached the rear of the van, Michael was beating the guards. They stunned the guards with high voltage tasers. The brothers drove the vehicles into the desert near the town of Bumblebee. Fat. One of the guards looked as if he had died from the beating. Michael decided that the other would have to die as well. He had a makeshift garrote in his pocket, a cord tied to two pieces of wood. And the one thing we found out about it, of course, is that Mike was obviously the, um, the planner, the instigator, and the enforcer and everything related to the crime, and that he was the one who physically murdered the two guards. Uh, Pat, of course, helped him at uh, Mike's insistence, but it was uh, Mike who put the rope around their neck and choked them. Went around the back. Patrick claimed that Michael had buried most of the money in the desert. Just had to stop. At least one of the Poland's relatives knew where that was. Because she cooperated, the authorities didn't prosecute her for her involvement. The money had rotted from the elements in the intervening years. Patrick's confession gave closure to the case. We knew most of it. We felt better, of course, when the person actually admits it because there's always some room for doubt until you get it from the, the heart and from the mouth of the perpetrator. The courts turned down all appeals for the Polans. The state of Arizona finally administered a lethal injection to Michael Poland on June 16, 1999. After all calls for clemency were denied, Patrick Poland was executed nine months later on March 15, 2000. Unlike his older brother, Patrick used his final moments to express regret for the pain and suffering he had caused. Three mysterious deaths in a Florida river confound local authorities. A preliminary investigation reveals little. But when police and the FBI find a sinister link to international drug smuggling, 
they uncover a conspiracy of unbridled greed and ruthless violence. It's a case that thrusts an entire city into chaos. In the 1980s, thousands of violent criminals flooded into America from Cuba and Colombia. Drugs hit South Florida, and the area, bloated with illicit wealth, became a violent powder keg. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In the bloody Miami drug wars, the winners got rich, the losers buried, and everyone was a target. Colombia, South America. Until the 1970s, life was simple but hard. Then, a failed economy gave way to a sharp rise in drug trafficking. The drug trade caused stiff competition that literally began to rip the country apart. Ruthless Colombian drug lords began consolidating their businesses into partnerships known as cartels. Death came to anyone who got in their way. As the cartel's influence grew, so did the American appetite for illicit drugs. And Miami became the prime point of entry for most of the cocaine smuggled into the country. And with it came bloodshed. Colombian assassins were sent to Miami to wipe out the local competition. The homicide rate grew to more than triple the national average for large cities. Miami was named the murder capital of the U.S. Former Metro Dade homicide detective Alex Alvarez recalls how in 1979, violence came to a Miami shopping mall. This date of birth is several drug traffickers bought out a, a, a step van. Uh, lined it with bulletproof vests and portholes and did a drug hit in the parking lot and sprayed it with, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rounds in the parking lot trying to kill their intended target. Two known drug traffickers were killed and several innocent bystanders were wounded. There were also incidents of high-speed pursuits on the expressway between two drug dealers that were just shooting it out on the expressway during rush hour traffic. And, and, and numerous people were being uh, injured and, and killed. It was like the wild, wild west, so there was a need to um, try to curb and stop um, these uh, drug traffickers who seemed to be out of control. A special squad was formed to deal with the violence. Central Tactical Unit, or CENTAC-26, was headquartered at the Metro Dade Police Department. Sergeant George Placencia was a detective assigned to the unit, the first of its kind in Miami. It was a 26 one in the nation. The purpose of forming that task force was that we would go out and monitor all the homicides in Dade County and pick and choose the ones that uh, we thought involved major drug traffickers and, and attempt to work that angle, the homicide angle, and dismantle the organization. By the mid-1980s, Constant pressure from law enforcement slowly changed the way drug traffickers were doing business in Miami. They got a little bit more sophisticated. They still did the murders, but not the, the, the shootouts in public. Drug traffickers went deep underground, organizing cells that excluded all but family and close friends. Many cells specialized in activities such as cocaine transportation, distribution, or money laundering. In only a few years, the business had become large and sophisticated, and still very deadly. On the afternoon of July 29th, 1985, a marine salvager working on the Miami River noticed something. 
Off the bow of his boat, floating in the water, was a body. By the time Metro-Dade County Police responded, dock workers had pulled two more bodies from the river. The coroner examined the deceased for any signs of trauma or gunshot wounds. He found none. It appeared that the three had drowned. On the bodies, officers found beepers, Rolex watches, and plenty of cash. Two were armed. Essentially, they were all carrying the tools of a drug smuggler. Metro-Dade police called Syntac 26. Sergeant Placencia investigated. Yeah, hold on, let me write this down. We started doing area cams to see if anybody had seen anything suspicious or had seen these individuals prior to them meeting their demise, and uh, that uh, proved to be, you know, not so fruitful at all. Nobody had seen anything. The three victims were identified as local Cuban Americans. Two had minor police records. The official cause of death was drowning, but there was no indication how they ended up in the water or why. Detective Alex Alvarez searched for a lead in the case. We began running uh, uh, records checks and contacting the Drug Enforcement Administration to see if these people were known drug traffickers. Agents at the DEA did not know the men, but they did have a source that could help. Right, right. What's, what's the address? They had an informant, and that informant knew the son of one of the dead people that were fished out of the Miami Rivers, and it was definitely drug-related. And he was going to uh, put us into contact with the son. That afternoon, investigators paid a visit to the son. I don't know why we're here. He was willing to tell what he knew, hoping that the mystery of his father's death could be solved. Can you, can you tell us what you know and how you found out about it? Well, I know it's a really big business. He, brings in thousands he told us that his father was one of the biggest drug smugglers in South Florida. He brought in thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of cocaine. Well, I know last Saturday he said he was... He said his father's crew used run-down steel-hulled vessels to smuggle drugs into the country, since the old boats aroused less suspicion than big yachts. He, had him later he on also detailed day. how the smugglers built false bulkheads into the boats, concealing hidden compartments filled with hundreds and sometimes thousands of pounds of cocaine. When customs searched these boats, their only hope of finding drugs would be to use a welding torch. See, the smugglers are, are smart. They know that there's no way that customs and the open ocean is going to put a torch to a boat because if they're wrong, they'll sink the boat. Now safely past customs, the smugglers would continue to move their enormous cargo up the Miami River. They would park at a marina um, and then let it sit there for two or three days to make sure there was no surveillance. And on the second, third, or fourth day, when they were convinced there was no surveillance, they'd come at the middle of the night, unload the, the drugs into vans, and ship them off to different locations within South Florida. The son said he had been visited by two of his father's friends who were on board the ship the night his father drowned. They told him that the boat was raided by a group of gunmen dressed as cops. The raiders threw the six-man crew overboard and then stole about 450 kilos of cocaine. Each kilo at that time was worth uh, approximately um, $60,000. So the net retail value of this load was approximately $27 million. Now that's not the street value. The street value is probably two, three times that. The son provided the names of all three men who survived, but said he didn't know how to contact them. The Sentac detectives needed to find out if there had been a legitimate raid at the marina. They contacted every law enforcement agency in South Florida that handled drug cases. 
none of them um, had any operations uh, close to uh, the boatyard where this incident happened. So at that time, when I, when I canceled out that this was a legitimate raid, my next focus was, well, these people must have been phony cops, people impersonating police officers, because there was a trend at that, to- at that time for people to dress up as police officers and, and, and raid uh, drug dealers' homes uh, and steal their cash and steal their drugs. To check the victim's son's story, investigators went to the marina where the raid took place. They interviewed the security guard who had been on duty that night. He said that seven or eight men in police uniforms rushed the marina and headed for one of the boats. They went right past the security guard. The security guard said, being South Florida, there's nothing unusual, you know, go at it. He hadn't gotten a good look at any of them. Investigators later searched that boat, but found no clues. So they turned their attention to looking for the three men who had survived the raid. Two of the three survivors had minor police records, but could not be located at their last known address. The next day, Sentac 26 detectives played a hunch. They figured that the survivors would likely be going to the wake for one of the deceased victims. So we showed up at the funeral home um, with the names and identities of the people who we were looking for. The detectives were right. They recognized the survivors from arrest photos and approached the men as they entered. The men confirmed the boat was overrun by a group of raiders dressed like cops. But the men denied the boat was involved in drug running. They claimed they were simply having a party. They had been drinking beer with the three victims and two additional friends. And while they were there drinking beer and having a good time, uh, people in blue uniforms stormed past the front gate of the marina and uh, started yelling, police, police. The gunmen began assaulting them. They said several friends were thrown in the water by these individuals dressed in blue uniforms. Within minutes, all six men were overboard in the Miami River. But only three swam to safety. The investigation had now become a triple homicide. The Sentac 26 detectives were convinced the raid was yet another instance of fake cops ripping off drug dealers. But again, the survivors denied that drugs were on the boat and insisted they did not know why the men attacked them. They said they didn't see any badge numbers of police cars, couldn't even tell which department the uniforms were from. With no detailed information from the two witnesses, the investigators were left without any significant leads. With the case stalled, the FBI offered their assistance. Special Agent Robert Martin. At about the same time that the the homicide investigation began regarding the three bodies found in the Miami River, uh, an FBI cooperating witness uh, provided some information to us regarding uh, a group of police officers who were involved in some rip-offs. And he identified who those guys were, at least uh, uh, several of them, knew who some of them were, had conversations with them. Detective Alvarez got an unexpected call from an agent in counterintelligence. He says he needs to meet with us, that he has a motive and a possible information about our case. He put two and two together, so maybe this is related to this information that I'm getting uh, through my informant, Armando Un. Now we, we, can, we can narrow down. Armando Un, the FBI agent said, was a well-connected nightclub worker that knew about a group of crooked cops who were ripping off drug dealers along the Miami River. Sentac 26 detectives went to see Armando Un. But he did not want to see them. 
the interview went nowhere. It would take the murder of a friend before Armando Un would talk. A motorist was driving through the Everglades. He spotted something that piqued his curiosity, a wooden box. He pulled over. To his horror, he found a body inside. He called police. Detectives from Miami-Dade's Drug Task Force, CENTAC 26, were investigating the deaths of three men found floating in the Miami River. They hoped an informant named Armando Un could help them. His friend and employer had been found murdered in the Florida Everglades. His name was Luis Rodriguez, the owner of a nightclub in Miami's Little Havana district. He'd been shot several times in the head and then stuffed in a box rigged to spring open. A gruesome display. Investigating for CENTAC 26 was Detective Alex Alvarez and Sergeant George Placencia. They needed to get Armando Un to talk. We never mentioned anything about the three bodies. Our ploy in speaking to him was that we were investigating the death of his best friend, the murder of his best friend. According to Detective Placencia, Armando Un was very candid. We sat down and chatted with him for, for a while about Luis Rodriguez. And uh, he said, yeah, Luis Rodriguez was involved in uh, drug trafficking. He admitted that Rodriguez was dealing drugs out of his nightclub and said he believed the men Rodriguez was involved with killed him. It is true that he was trafficking drugs. He was furious that his friend had been murdered and said he wanted to help. He was making money for everybody. He would but if he knew money. about police officers, real or fake, robbing drug dealers, he said nothing. He never mentioned that the police officers were involved. He did say that Luis Rodriguez was friendly with some officers. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Armando Un seemed wary and selected his words carefully. When the interview ended, the detectives still had no suspects in the Miami River murders. All they really knew was that Luis Rodriguez was dead and may be the fourth drug murder victim in as many days. So then a city of Miami detective contacted Placencia and Alvarez with a surprising lead. He said that Luis Rodriguez had also worked for him as a police informant. He told us that Luis Rodriguez was giving him information about people who were dressed as um, police impostors and were ripping off drug dealers and committing murders in Dade County. The detective explained that he had met Luis Rodriguez through a Miami patrol officer named Marco Ribera. I said, we need your help now. I need you to set up a meeting between the street cop and George and I, and let's tell them that we're investigating Luis Rodriguez's murder. That'll be the cover story. The meeting was set for that night at the Miami Police Department. Officer Ribeiro worked the late shift in 60 sector, police code for Little Havana. He verified that he knew Luis Rodriguez and that Rodriguez had, on occasion, been his informant. But then, without prompting, he brought up the Miami River drownings. He volunteered some information about the three bodies that were floating up in the Miami River. He said that these guys stole the drugs themselves, and when the owner of the drugs found out about it, had them uh, murdered or they were thrown in the, in the water and drowned themselves, that there was no cops involved at all. His denial that officers were involved, which no one had mentioned, seemed too forceful. The CENTAC 26 detectives tested him. We asked uh, this patrolman to repeat his story at, at, the, at the conclusion of our meeting, and we detected that uh, the story didn't fit the, the, the first story that he had told us. There was something wrong there. Rivera claimed a street source told him about the raid, so the detectives asked to speak directly with the source. 
I guess so. You know, just give me a call tomorrow. Okay. I'll, I'll try to contact him, and if I can't get in contact with him for any reason, I'll let you guys know. Okay. For the Syntec investigators, the case had taken a dramatic turn. This officer, sworn to uphold the law, seemed to be hiding something. The following day, Officer Marco Rivera introduced the detectives to the source who allegedly had information about the Miami River murders. I don't know if I should even be talking to these guys. I don't even know, bro. Rivera claimed his source could verify that drug trafficking Colombians had carried out the raid, not Miami cops. Hey, listen on, man. Hey, listen, we understand that But as the source spoke, he had a hard time remembering details of his story. Officer Rivera had to help him remember, according to Detective Alvarez. The officer keeps having to correct him. No, 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 it happened like this, and tell him about this, and he's filling in the blanks for this guy who's obviously been, been coached and cued on what to say. So we knew at that point, obviously, he was covering something up. Officer Rivera's cover-up meant the detectives were faced with an even more serious problem. In case the deadly raiders were actually Miami police officers, they needed to be very careful. This is a problem that we weren't really um, trained or focused in to investigate, which is, you know, uh, we're not internal affairs investigators. We don't um, investigate cops. That wasn't our role. That wasn't our job. But. We were charged with the responsibilities of investigating these murders, and if these murders were committed by cops, they were fair play. We realized that if we were going to start to investigate cops, we'd have to do things very differently. The Syntac 26 detectives had to cover themselves. They asked the police chief to hold their personnel files as a precaution against internal leaks. We did a lot of things to protect our, our, our identity and our family's identity. We took everything that we had in our names and took them out of our names so they couldn't trace where we lived and who we were. You know, we're investigating. They're going to find out who we are. So right away, we, we, we built a wall between them and us. Once they felt safe, Sentac detectives began investigating the officers working the night shift in 60 Sector, Little Havana. Officer Marco Rivera's beat. With the chief's permission, Miami PD's internal affairs gave Sentac 26 the personnel records for the officers in question. Well, the city of Miami Internal Affairs Unit was very concerned. Uh, they were very cooperative. Uh, they, you know, the names that we provided to them, uh, they started looking into and uh, giving us the backgrounds that they had on these individuals. The investigators focused on a close-knit group of eight officers, all relatively recent hires who joined the force at a time when Miami was in crisis. In the spring of 1980, Cuban President Fidel Castro had announced he would allow thousands of political refugees to seek asylum in foreign countries. The U.S. agreed to accept 3,500. Then, unexpectedly, Castro announced that for the first time in years, he would also allow American boats to enter Mariel Harbor. The result was what became known as the Mariel Boat Lift. More than 120,000 Cuban refugees flooded into South Florida, which overwhelmed Miami's ability to handle them. Most were hardworking immigrants looking for a chance at the American dream. Most, but not all. 10% of them was estimated were criminals that were dumped out of the uh, prison system of Fidel Castro. Um, so there was a spike in the crime wave in, in Miami-Dade County. To stem the rising crime rate, the city had to hire over 400 new cadets in three years. Instead of hiring the best candidate, they hired um, anybody who was just marginally acceptable. Uh, they just couldn't find enough uh, quality candidates, and they went for quantity as opposed to quality. Syntac 26 began surveillance, watching as the officers in question hung out together after hours, enjoying lifestyles far beyond the means of honest police officers. 
Marco Rivera was the suspected ringleader. Armando Garcia had recently become part owner of a bodybuilding gym. Osvaldo Coelho had just retired from the force. He was 30 years old, driving a $100,000 Lotus. It was easy to track their lavish spending. One officer uh, bought a home and uh, built this pool, and he paid the, uh, the developer cash, showed up with a bag full of cash, and gave it to him here for the purchase of my home. Still, the detectives had little solid evidence. Yeah, I'm in front of the restaurant. I don't see any uh, marked units over here, but our boy is definitely over here having coffee with some uh, friends uh, outside, but I don't see any units. They needed first-hand information, and they needed it soon. If these officers had already left at least three people dead, the detectives feared there could easily be more. Four people have been murdered in Miami over a $27 million drug deal gone bad. With so much money involved, the dividing line between the criminals and the cops blurred. The FBI offered their assistance to local law enforcement. Special Agent Robert Martin. We began an investigation, which became a joint investigation, into whether there was some police corruption in the city of Miami. Drug task force detectives with CENTAC 26 had narrowed their investigation to a suspected group of corrupt Miami police officers. But the detectives needed inside information if they had any chance of cracking the case. They hoped they could get it from a reluctant police informer named Armando Un. They had already interviewed Un about the murder of his friend and partner, nightclub owner Luis Rodriguez. He seemed wary, perhaps afraid they too were dirty cops. Hey, Armando, when you look at these photographs, see if you recognize anyone. Detective George Placencia tried to win his trust by showing photos of their surveillance of the suspect officers. And he started looking through the photos, and he just paused. He dropped the photographs and shook her hand, and he says, you guys are doing a good job. Let's sit down and talk. But unfortunately, these things go wrong. Sometimes. Un came down to Centac 26, where he told Detective Alex Alvarez he figured he had nothing to lose. Okay. He was scared. He thought, well, if I stick it out with the crooked cops, they, pro they were the ones that probably killed my partner. And he said, well, if they killed him, the next person to go is me. In a marathon debriefing, he explained the origins of the rogue officers and their criminal enterprise. He said his friend and employer, nightclub owner Luis Rodriguez, had grown tired of the officers coming into his bar and shaking down his patrons for small amounts of drugs. He wanted to make sure that his customers weren't bothered. So he first started paying the cops off not to come. Soon he devised another plan that could make everyone some money. According to Un, Luis Rodriguez uh, said to the officers, hey, you know what? Instead of arresting these people that are coming over here with uh, petty drugs, why don't I set up deals, you know, maybe multi-kilo deals, more drugs involved, and uh, when these people come over, I'll give you a description of their car, where they're coming from. You can stop them, steal their cocaine, bring it to me, I'll sell it, I'll give you a share. The officers agreed. What made this whole thing possible for these cops was they grew up and knew people who were in the drug trade. And that was the one aspect of what they had going for them. Patrolman Marco Ribera ran the ripoffs. It seemed a perfect plan. The dealers would never incriminate themselves by reporting the thefts, and Rodriguez would always come through with the cash. 
Get in the car. You have a good night now. Un said the operation grew quickly, with more and more cops becoming involved. But they got greedy, wanting to do more rip-offs and bigger ones. Rodriguez introduced them to a second bar owner who knew of larger shipments. Luis Rodriguez brought in another bar owner. He knew and he worked smuggling boatloads of drugs into the United States. And Rodriguez says, wait a minute, why stop, why stop at these one kilo, two kilograms of cocaine uh, drug bust? Why don't we go for the boatloads and get 300, 400, 500 kilograms of cocaine at one shot? Un didn't know about the raid where the three men drowned, but he did describe an earlier one the second bar owner had set up. A group of Miami officers had slipped aboard a boat in another marina, thinking the crew had left for the night. They knew exactly where the drugs were hidden. But during the unloading, they noticed the air conditioning was on. And suspected the crew was still on board, hiding. surrendered. The Raiders wasted no time disposing of the crew, as they had in the other raid. This time, no one drowned. All the men swam safely to shore. The cops finished up then drove off with about 200 kilos of cocaine, valued at over $10 million. Armando Un confirmed the names of the officers involved, the very one Sentak had been watching. Unfortunately, the investigators knew his credibility would be attacked in court. Jury's not gonna believe Armando Un and it self-proclaimed admitted drug trafficker over, you know, half a dozen or a dozen respected police officers. They're just not going to believe it. So we need more evidence. What they needed was a confession on tape from the very cops they were investigating. They brought in the local bar owner from the drug raids and explained the evidence they had implicating him in the ripoffs. He reluctantly agreed to wear a wire and to meet with Officer Marco Ribera. But he said Ribera had been avoiding him for weeks, no doubt because of the Sentac 26 investigation. They would have to trick him into the meeting. Investigators hoped the results would be worth the risk. Detectives set up in a building across from a bar in the area Ribera patrolled and sent the informant inside. When surveillance units confirmed Ribera was nearby, detectives called 911 and reported a bar fight. Officer Ribera drove up just as they planned. Rivera entered, looking for the alleged fight, but everything was quiet. The informant made his move. He told the officer he had been subpoenaed by the U.S. Attorney's Office and wanted to know what to say. 
Ribera took the bait, but he didn't want to talk in front of witnesses. The corrupt cop spoke freely about his involvement in the drug operation. Ribera had no idea everything he said was being recorded. In Miami, investigators pursued a group of rogue police officers suspected of ripping off drug dealers and killing at least three of them. The detectives of Sentac 26 finally managed to tape an incriminating conversation with the group's leader, Officer Ribera, as he talked about the raids, the drugs, the dirty cops. Detective Alex Alvarez. It was key, it was key, key evidence because it was the corrupt police officer's own words about what he did, when he did it, and who he did it with. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami reviewed the tapes. Assistant U.S. Attorney Russell Killinger knew they would need as much evidence as possible to convince a jury that several Miami law enforcement officers were behind the murders and thefts. The tapes provided a good start, but Killinger needed more evidence to implicate the other officers. Perhaps Armando Un could get it. We wanted to get Un uh, uh, wearing a wire and talking to the other cops so that we get those other cops to confirm their own participation out of their own mouths. Wearing a wire, Un met with Miami officers Marco Ribera and Armando Garcia. He told them that investigators were asking him questions about the boat raids. They warned him not to cooperate. He assured him Sentac had nothing on any of them. But then they became suspicious, asking him if he was wired. That effectively halted all plans to record any more of the officers. But investigators were undaunted. We decided to more take more of an overt approach uh, in the investigation and, 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 and go to the, the next level, which was basically um, uh, subpoenaing witnesses to the grand juries, uh, issuing bank subpoenas uh, for bank records and financial records. Investigators began cataloging the assets of the suspects, including Marco Ribera's safety deposit box at a Miami bank. The box contained over $260,000 in cash, nearly 10 times his annual salary. Like Ribera, the other suspect officers left incriminating money trails. The money was burning holes in their pockets, and they were going out and spending money left and right. They'd buy 20, 30, 40, $50,000 cars, cash. They bought homes valued in excess of $200,000, cash. They bought expensive furniture. They put down cash. Now, this is an officer who's making $30,000. We had a, an enormous amount of evidence. The financial records, together with the tape conversations, were enough evidence for arrest warrants to be issued. Respecting you guys. Two days after Christmas 1985, Sentac 26, Miami PD, and the FBI began the arrests, taking down six Miami cops, including the ringleader, Officer Marco Ribera. Officer Armando Garcia was also arrested without incident. Osvaldo Coelho and Emilio Rey surrendered in the following days. The trial began on September 29, 1986. Federal prosecutors thought they had a strong case. We felt pretty good about the case. We'd gotten pretty much all the evidence in that, that we had hoped to get in. Then, on January 21st, 1987, the jury came back with their verdicts. 
I remember the judge just kept looking, looking at the at the at the verdict forms, and he would look at one and put it down, and look at another and put it down, then pick up the other one, and look at it again, and and this went on for it seemed like an eternity, uh, and then he started shaking his head. The jury was deadlocked, causing the judge to declare a mistrial. One juror had refused to deliberate. Investigators were stunned as all suspects were released. That was really a low point in the investigation. We found out later because the jurors that the 11 jurors that voted for um, for conviction were so convinced that these officers, because of all the evidence, were guilty. They started coming forward and saying, you know, um, we started being contacted by we started getting contacted by friends and family members of uh, these cops offering us jobs and offering us money, and we knew that that was an attempt to try to to get us to sway our votes. The mistrial was an enormous setback. Detectives knew if they could not put these corrupt cops away, the people of Miami may never trust law enforcement again. A group of Miami officers were arrested and prosecuted for corruption, but chaos in the jury room resulted in a mistrial. All suspects were released. They were thrilled that they weren't convicted. Uh, what they didn't realize that it was probably a blessing in disguise for us because all that did is give us more time and we were more determined to find out more evidence against them and that's exactly what happened. The prosecutor and detectives were unwilling to give up. With so much at stake, investigators needed a break. They finally got one. We found out um, that these officers had hired a hitman to kill um, Armando Un. That hitman was Killer Joe Martinez. He confessed to being hired, hoping he'd get leniency for another crime he had committed. We brought him in. He testified against the, the river cops. We were able to add more charges against them. And by that time, you know, the case was just becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and they had nowhere to go, and then they started to fold, and they started to cooperate. The case finally broke wide open when one of the defendants, patrolman Emilio Ray, decided to confess. Through his lawyer, he had learned of the additional evidence against him. He hoped for sentencing leniency in exchange for his testimony. Uh, he described to us some, some fairly uh, bone-chilling uh, uh, conspiracies that, that, that had gone on and that were going on in an effort to, uh, to try to, to kill the government witnesses. All of the government's witnesses, especially Armando Un, were in danger. Investigators knew they had to use Patrolman Ray's confession to put more pressure on the other river cops. Facing the beefed-up federal case, ringleader Marco Rivera confessed. He had implicated uh, some 60 other city of Miami police officers in various uh, criminal activities. Unfortunately, Osvaldo Coelho and Armando Garcia fled the Miami area. Five months later, an FBI informant said Coelho was hiding in the Bahamas. The FBI has no formal jurisdiction outside the United States, so it maintains legal attache offices called legats in many foreign countries. They work as liaisons with each country's national police. The FBI liaison asked the Bahamian police for their assistance. They agreed to help get Coelho. Coelho was wanted for taking part in massive and deadly cocaine ripoffs in Miami. Investigators knew he had a broad network of friends he could ask for help. Coelho called one of them several times to arrange for assistance.
Yeah, I can help you. What do you need? Okay, I can do that. Good. See you later. What Coelho didn't know was that the FBI had already approached the friend, and he was working as an informant. The Bahamian police arrested Osvaldo Coelho without incident. He was extradited back to Miami to face charges of drug trafficking, conspiracy, and racketeering. Armando Garcia was the last of the rogue Miami cops still at large. On January 8, 1989, the FBI added Garcia to their 10 most wanted fugitives list. FBI Special Agent Robert Martin. We don't pick our top 10 fugitives lightly. They have to be people that we consider to be a serious danger, not only to society, but to the very nature and fabric of what makes our country what it is. And one of those things is, is uh, honest, uh, honest law enforcement services. Uh, our Garcia was added to the list for that reason. The FBI had evidence that Garcia may have fled to South America, but had few leads. Special Agent Robert Martin ran the public corruption squad that kept searching for the elusive fugitive. Armando Garcia was, was uniquely qualified to, to understand what it was going to take to survive uh, out of the country. Uh, here was a police officer who knew every technique that we might use to, to find him or capture him. A guy that knew the difficulties uh, moving in and out of foreign countries and doing investigations in those foreign countries. On top of that, you had a guy that had a lot of money. Hey, I was just looking at these passports. Garcia could be anywhere. For four years, agents looked into hundreds of leads with negative results. Then, in late 1993, the FBI got a tip. A friend was planning to visit the Garcia family in Colombia. She didn't have it. Agents worked with the Colombian police who followed the friend to an apartment in Cali. Agents believed that fugitive Armando Garcia was living there. Uh, the Colombian National Police set up a surveillance with a number of units. It was going to be a 24 hour surveillance and uh, waited to see if they could identify uh, anybody who had come out or traveled around with her. Three days later, they spotted Armando Garcia. The fugitive was caught off guard, unarmed. Holy Garcia! Garcia told them, said, I have $4,000 with me. I have, you see the jewelry I have, you see my automobile. I have goods and belongings in my apartment. You can have all of that if you just let me go. And to quote the Colombian National Police uh, official who came to Miami to, to, to describe events, uh, they then told Armando Garcia, we're not the dirty cops, you are. The last of the main suspects, Armando Garcia pleaded guilty to drug trafficking, racketeering, and tax evasion, and was sentenced to 25 years. When it was all over, 17 Miami officers were convicted for their involvement in the drug ripoff ring. It was the largest police corruption case in Florida history. In response to the scandal, the city of Miami Police Department formed its own internal investigations unit that targeted over 100 additional officers. They obviously were suffering from all the media exposure and then the embarrassment of having numerous officers arrested, but I think it made them a stronger department. When you weed out the bad officers, you know, um, it just make the, makes the good officers shine even brighter.